It's 8 o'clock. This is the UK Tonight. I'm Matt Barbet. Coming up, the sheer scale of the conspiracy theories surrounding the Princess of Wales are revealed. A Sky News poll suggests more than half of people in the UK have seen a theory about Kate online. And the questions about her health continue. That's despite a video which emerged last night of the Princess shopping with William over the weekend. But doubt was cast on it almost immediately. Coming up, we'll ask what else the royals can do to end the speculation and why those conspiracy theories just will not stop. Also tonight, safeguarding football or weakening it. The government announces its plan for an independent regulator designed to stop clubs from going bust. But will it really create a level playing field? We'll discuss the plan with clubs at opposite ends of the league pyramid. Plus, I'll be speaking to Love Island's Amy Hart about cyber flashing. That's now a specific crime, and the first person convicted of it was jailed for more than a year today. And Johnson, Aaron Taylor Johnson, will get the latest on reports that James Bond producers are set to name him as their new 007. All that to come, and much more, here on The UK Tonight. Good evening. We start tonight with the ongoing questions for the royal family and the sheer scale of conspiracy theories that are surrounding the Princess of Wales online. A Sky News poll suggests more than half of people in the UK have seen a theory about Kate's health. Despite that, people's trust in the royal family is largely unchanged and most people believe they've handled Kate's health problems well. But the questions, of course, continue on social media, even after a video emerged of the princess shopping with husband William at the weekend. Almost immediately, doubt was cast on that video's authenticity, and a Kate lookalike even had to deny claims that she was the woman in the clip and not the princess. Our royal correspondent, Rhiannon Mills, reports. All right. For a man I'm told is deeply frustrated by the current scrutiny, you wouldn't know it. Prince William was in Sheffield focusing on his homelessness project when he knows that everyone is still talking about Kate and not her early years work. This is the video of them together that's gone viral. Seen at a farm shop in Windsor, showing the princess appears to be OK after weeks of vicious conspiracy theories about her health. The palace don't like it, but in some ways it does succeed where this photograph failed and just caused more rumours. It's also now come to light that this picture, taken by Kate of the Queen and her grandchildren, was also altered. A photo forensics expert telling us there are at least three vertical edits and a variation in the light reflections in their eyes. But despite everything, a poll for Sky News seems to suggest it's not having an impact on their reputation. I just thought it's so common that this happens nowadays, photoshopping and image altering. Didn't really think much of it. I think somebody's health matters are their personal matters and while we might have an interest, I think we should leave it at that. I wish they would leave them all alone and let them get on with their life. It would be a lot better. There's not really a new strategy in place. They simply hope that carrying on with their work will maintain their credibility, especially among those who may doubt them. Having someone like Prince William support and sort of support this campaign and want to deliver it and end homelessness, I think is absolutely huge. From Buckingham Palace, these unexpected pictures of the King meeting Korean war veterans were a reminder of their slightly different tack, keeping the monarch visible as they all realise they can't control social media. I actually do think that the uh, never complain, never explain strategy is just not feasible. So just look at the amount of coverage there is on social media that comes out of the palace about the royal family. Look at the information we're given. I, I do think that strategy has been adapted quite significantly. William and Kate's general popularity has probably helped them to get through this in a way that maybe other members of the royal family wouldn't have been able to. But I'm told that both of them do think that at times it has got out of control and keep asking how they can make it stop. Support from the public will come as a welcome relief in what has been a relentless media storm and potentially only encourage William when it comes to protecting his family's privacy. Rhiannon Mills, Sky News in Sheffield.
I'm joined now by our Royal Correspondent, Laura Bundock, and that question Rhiannon mentioned there, how can they make it stop, is key to all this. If we take it at face value, it started with, well, a stay in hospital, which is no, not fun for anybody, then a photo, which they owned up, said, look, we know, we fiddle around with this and it wasn't quite how it seemed, but still, it continues. How, what can they do? I mean, that is the big problem for them. And I think it's interesting, you know, we heard in that report talking about, you know, the late Queen's mantra, never complain, never explain, that's changed. But I think her mantra, you have to be seen to be believed, is relevant here more than ever, I think. I mean, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's video, isn't it, of a couple going to the local farm shop, picking up some bits at the weekend <laughs> and walking out Very again. Very normal. Who hasn't done that, frankly? Or, you know, gone to the shops, gone out like that. But it's made global headlines. It's made global headlines because we haven't seen Kate since Christmas Day. And the speculation, the rumour, the conspiracy has spiralled out of control. It's felt unstoppable at times. I think this image hasn't done them any harm today. I think, you know, it, it, they might not have liked it getting out there, but it was a member of the public innocently, you know, picking it up. And, and you, you, we see her. We see Kate. We see that she seems well. She's with William, and she's kind of getting on with, with, with what looks like normal life. So... That's good. I mean, I was reminded recently, someone saying, when Queen Victoria, going way back, <laughs> you know, following the death of Albert, just hid away for ages and ages. Mm. She faced huge speculation, but, of course, she wasn't facing social media. And that is the massive difference, and that is the huge problem at the moment. Look, will it quell the conspiracy and calm everything down? Kensington Palace will be keeping everything crossed, it will. And Prince William... Homelessness means so much to him. Remember, it was a cause he was introduced to by his mother. That is what he wants to be focusing on. That is what he's trying to be talking about. And yet, in the background, this is this is still huge. And, you know, it might calm down a bit. Is it going to go away? I doubt it. Mm. Imagine if the Victorians had social media. It would have been horrendous. <laughs> uh, Laura, thank you very much indeed. I want to talk more about this now uh, and about the conspiracy theories around Kate's health and the way the royal family has dealt with those questions being asked online. Let's bring in Vanity Fair royal correspondent Katie Nicholl. We're also joined as well by senior lecturer in psychology at Nottingham Trent University, Daryl Cookson, whose research focuses on conspiracy theories. Katie, to you first. What can they do? Because, look, we know nature abhors a vacuum, but social media abhors it even more, and there clearly isn't enough to satisfy people going online. Well, I, I don't think there's an awful lot they can do other than actually not pay too much attention to some of the wilder conspiracy theories that are out there. It's very interesting, isn't it? We 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 know that there's this arrangement and agreement between the palace and the media. We were asked to to leave the princess alone during her recovery, um, and um, you know the publication of this image in the Sun. Obviously, it was on TMZ's website as well. Is is interesting, um, and as yet, no action from the palace in terms of legal action against the newspaper publishing it, because it is technically a breach of her privacy when she's been asked to be left alone. But on this occasion, that breach of privacy has almost worked in their favour because it's it's achieved what they want to, which is to actually get that message out that, that she is OK, she is recovering. She's not, as some wild conspiracy theorists would have it, in a coma or, or not alive anymore or recovering from some botched cosmetic surgery. So I think in this instance, it, it's worked in the palace's favour. Um, but I don't think they're going to do actually anything until the princess is ready to come back, carry out royal engagements on her terms and when she's ready. And the one thing I've learned about this woman from the many years I've been covering her is that she's not going to be forced into doing anything. She's got a great inner strength about her and she will come back to work when she's ready. Her priority is getting better and her three young children as it absolutely should be. And she is not one to bow to pressure, not least the ridiculous levels of pressure that we've seen on social media. Hopefully she's ignoring it and the palace are too, as much as they can. I doubt they are, though, let's be honest. And the thing is, Daryl, that's because, as I said at the start there, the conspiracy theories persist. You're an expert on this kind of thing. You understand the psychology of it. Why has it taken root as it has this time? Oh, I think there's um, lots of reasons for that, unfortunately. From a psychology point of view, perhaps it's not too surprising that there's this flurry of conspiracy theories at the moment. Like you were saying, with the exposure online um, is phenomenal. So, so many people are seeing this online. Maybe if they see it from lots of different sources, they're more likely to take it on board. And research also tends to show as well, if we see people 
that we relate to, so people that we know sharing conspiracy theories, then they are more likely to become something that we believe. I think um, another thing as well influencing the spread of these conspiracy theories is sometimes when people are feeling uncertain about things or if they're searching for meaning and if they're searching for answers, then unfortunately sometimes conspiracy theories can provide that answer. They're quite difficult to falsify, probably why even when there's like video footage and things like that, you can see them being so persistent because they can be difficult to address, they can be difficult to falsify. Um, so sometimes if we're looking for an answer or if we're trying to make sense out of something, they, they can, in the moment, give the answer and therefore be, be attractive to people. Mm. Katie, back to you. Um, Laura, my colleague, just mentioned that obviously the Queen's mantra was never complain, never explain. But actually the royals this time round, both with the King's health and Catherine's, sort of half explained what was going on, leaving things open to interpretation. Have they sort of caused this problem to a degree? Well, I think it's difficult, Matt, because they can't avoid the fact, and they couldn't have kept Catherine's surgery a secret because there were engagements lined up. There was a, a reported trip to Rome in the pipeline. What were they meant to do? They had to. They had to be honest. Um, they haven't been as transparent with with the actual procedure. We know it was abdominal surgery. We don't actually know why. Whereas with Buckingham Palace, we we were told more detailed information about the king. So. They recognise that they do need to be more open. They recognise that there's a need for transparency. You know, the transition from the late Queen Elizabeth, where we never heard about her medical issues, or indeed the late Duke of Edinburgh, to where we are now. We've, we've come on leaps and bounds. But I suppose with that transparency and that partial honesty or whatever they're prepared to tell us does come problems, that you're sort of feeding this insatiable beast that then wants to know absolutely everything. But I think we have to remind ourselves that, yes, they are members of the royal family, but they're also human beings. They're entitled to a degree of privacy and private lives, particularly when it comes to their to their personal private medical history. Um, you know, at some point, I think we may well hear the Princess of Wales go into some detail about why she was in hospital. I think that's possible further down the line. But again, as I say, sort of harking back to what I know about her and that very sort of strong sense of duty, that that strength within her, I, I think it will be on her terms when she's ready to do it. Daryl, when conspiracy theories take hold and, you know, you happen to be at the receiving end of this, what can the people who the focus is on do to stop them dead? Is there anything that would, that would stop this from happening from this point onwards? Um, that's a really interesting question. And a lot of my research, I guess, is looking for the answer, like what can we do to address these conspiracy theories? Because they can have really, we're seeing now that they can have really problematic, they can have quite dangerous consequences when a lot of people are endorsing them. So it is really important to try and understand why and then how they can be addressed. But what we do tend to see in research, as we're seeing now, is they, they can be really sticky. So once people kind of endorse a conspiracy theory or one gets going, they can be really difficult. I think one thing that's quite important is conspiracy theories are often quite related to people's thinking styles. So rather than something that I guess those at the heart of the conspiracy theory can do, maybe something people can think about in general is how they kind of think and process information. So what we tend to see is people are more critically thinking or if they think more analytically, then they can be a little bit more, I guess, resistant to the spread of these conspiracy theories. So I guess encouraging or improving these analytical or critical thinking skills when we see all this information online is something that's really important. But in terms of what those people at the heart of the conspiracy theory can do to kind of quash these rumours is really difficult because, as you, as we were saying before, as you've been saying, a lot of the time conspiracy theories are kind of, they, they take a life of their own, so they can be really difficult to kind of um, get rid of, really. So sometimes I do think trying to encourage critical thinking and checking information is some of the key ways to address these. Yeah, I'm not sure that the, the short-term dopamine hit of social media really gets people thinking critically about what they are reading, does it, Katie? Look, let, let's just take a slightly different view of this because our polling at Sky News has shown there is still a lot of support for the royals. More people than not think they've done it the right way 
Katie. I mean, mm -hmm. if you were being generous, you could say the interest is because a lot of people just care about them. Well, yes, I think I think you're absolutely right. And I think there there is a, a probably a genuine contingent of people out there on social media who have been following this story because they do care. I mean, the Princess of Wales is and always has been one of the most popular members of the royal family. She's also always been very visible, um, very duty bound, always out there, always with a smile. She's young, she's fit, we're used to seeing her around and she's a role model. So, you know, I think this fact that there has been this long period of absence where we haven't seen her since Christmas Day has got people wondering and, and, and has got the conspiracy theorists going. But I think the majority of people, you would have to hope, are pretty sensible, understand that this is a young woman who's trying to overcome what was clearly serious and major surgery and let's not forget in all of this when the palace came out and told us about this procedure back in January they also made it absolutely clear that she wanted privacy she wanted that time to recover um, and that she wouldn't be coming back or being seen in public until after Easter I think we just live in an age where you know we're incredibly impatient we want answers to everything we we, we want to know the here and now the ins and outs and as much as the royal family have been willing to evolve and we've seen that on their social media platform you know, there's got to be a point where, where where that sort of endless scrutiny and speculation ends, and I and I think, well, you you I think you can see that, and Rhiannon sort of hinted at that in her report that the couple are very frustrated by this, um, and I suspect probably very upset by it as well. When you consider um, everything they do and how much they devote to public duty, to sort of then have this tide of or tsunami of, of social media against them and, and questioning things, and much of it that came off the back of that Mother's Day photo, which was really just intended to put something nice out there it turned in such a way that I know neither of them expected to happen I think they've been quite stunned by all of this yes some some photoshop lessons wouldn't go amiss right now would they uh, Katie Daryl thank you both very much indeed for taking the time next the first person convicted under England and Wales's new cyber flashing law has been jailed for 15 months Nicholas Hawkes sent unsolicited pictures to a 15 year old girl and also a woman in her 60s Cyber flashing has become so widespread that more than three quarters of teenage girls say they've fallen victim to it. I'm joined now by Love Islander Amy Hart, who was repeatedly targeted by cyber flashing as uh, her social media uh, took off. Uh, Amy, thanks so much for, for joining me. Tell us what happened Thank to you. Thank you, Amy. Um, well, from when I came out of the Love Island villa, I went from 2,500 followers to 750,000, hitting 1.3 million a couple of weeks later. Um, and my experience of social media before I went into Love Island was really positive. And then there's a lot of trial and tribulations that come with a, a, like a following that's grown exponentially. Um, and one of those is cyber flashing. So I had, uns oh, I still have now, unsolicited pictures in my DMs um, of men's genitals, uh, being tagged in stories that are um, explicit pictures, mm -hmm. and it's just awful. How do you deal with it? I block people, but luckily for all of us, these two women have been so brave and have taken this to the police, and now we have got the first conviction, the first sentencing. Mm. What do you think about the uh, the conviction and sentencing today? This man gets uh, 15 months in prison as a result. Well, I think it's brilliant. I think it shows that it's being taken really seriously. Um, I hope it will give other people um, the courage to report things like this. Obviously, I do think the law needs to be taken further as well. At the moment, it's um, intent-based. It needs to be consent-based. So he pleaded guilty. He said that he was sharing those pictures to harm, humiliate or cause offence, whereas anyone could say, oh, it was just a joke, it was just banter. So the law needs to be changed so it's consent-based. Have you consented to receiving that picture? No, you haven't. So it's wrong. Do you wonder what goes through their minds doing this? Because we've been discussing it today on the team, thinking, why, why would you? Why on earth would someone want to do this? Do you, do you stop and think about that? I do. I, I really don't understand. I don't understand anything. But I think it is... We have got the statistics. It do, it's how it starts. They start by cyber flashing, and if they're not caught out, they do go on to do worse things in violence against predominantly women and girls, but it does apply to everyone. Is that, is um, that the I, case? Is, is it a sort of gateway to worse behaviour, you think? Yes, 100%, because there's only so many times that you'll get that thrill out of sending a picture online mm. before you go out and do something worse. Um, you know, people 
sort of flashing in real life has been a thing for a long time. Now people can do it without even leaving their house. Mm. But Carmen, dad of girls, and they both use social media. What would you say to them about it? Um, just to make sure you've only, you know, your settings are really sort of iron tight so people can't message you if you don't know them, especially teenage girls. Um, you know, block people, report people, and, you know, if someone cyber flashes you, take it to the police. Good idea. Amy, I really appreciate you uh, joining us this evening. Thank you very much Thank indeed. Thank you. Now, the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, has made a big policy announcement this evening that could potentially upset her party. Our Deputy Political Editor, Sam Coates, joins me now from the City of London. Sam, what's she said? Well, Matt, here we are at a prominent lecture just given by Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, and she has done something that I suspect is going to upset many on the left of the Labour Party, could even upset, uh, upset some uh, in the front Labour front bench. She has committed to copy one of the key Tory rules about how much you can borrow and the restraints on borrowing uh, that you uh, will have to follow. She has said that she is going to basically cut and paste Jeremy Hunt. Now, they're known as fiscal rules. It, it, it's basically restraint on how much you can borrow uh, after several years. She's going, to, she's going to cut and paste that rule and she will impose it if she becomes shadow, if she becomes chancellor, uh, the first female chancellor after an election. This is hugely important because it will significantly constrain the amount of money that Labour can borrow after an election, dramatically narrowing the options for higher spending after an election, which some on the Labour left think is worrying. Th some think that that does not need, uh, does not leave enough gap between Labour and the Conservatives. Rachel Reeves thinks that you need to emphasise um, how Labour will look after people's money, but given the Labour Party is 20 points ahead, doubling down even further by um, uh, creating yet more self-imposed limits that make it harder to spend more on health and education post-election. Uh, well, that is going to worry some. Sam, thanks very much. Still to come here on The UK Tonight. Safeguarding football or potentially weakening the English game, the government sets out its plan for the new independent regulator. It's a diet pattern followed by millions of people. Rishi Sunak is a fan as well. But could intermittent fasting actually be bad for you? And from High Wycombe to Hollywood, has a new bond been born? As the rumour mill stirs, we'll ask whether this guy, Aaron Taylor-Johnson, has the credentials to be 007. Lisa Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, is back-breaking work. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home.
Now, intermittent fasting is a diet used by millions of people who swear it's the best way to lose some weight, but new research has found it may radically increase the risk of death due to cardiovascular disease. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says that for him, intermittent fasting is an important part of a balanced lifestyle. But is he right? Our health correspondent Ashish Joshi has the story. Are you fasting today? No, not today. I fast probably once or twice a week. But not... Suzanne turned to intermittent fasting about five years ago to manage her menopausal weight gain. I eat for eight hours and then fast for 16. Intermittent fasters like Suzanne only eat during a window of up to eight hours and go without food for the rest of the time. Famous fasters include Rishi Sunak, Jennifer Aniston and Elon Musk. What does intermittent fasting do for you? What are the benefits for you? It's given me so many benefits. I sleep better, um, my eating is controlled, I don't crave food, my blood sugars go down, um, I have a tendency to have high cholesterol in my family, so I keep an eye on that. And when I fast, I know it has benefits to knock that down. But a new report from the United States has found this way of controlled eating could have potentially serious health risks. It found that people who fasted for 16 hours or more a day had a 91% higher risk of death due to cardiovascular disease. And among people with existing cardiovascular disease, fasting for 14 to 16 hours a day was associated with a 66% higher risk of death from heart disease or stroke. It found time-restricted eating did not reduce the overall risk of death from any cause. The report is not peer-reviewed and its own authors stress that this kind of study could not prove cause and effect. It only looked at two days worth of food intake, and it only looked at the people who didn't eat for 16 hours or so over those periods. We don't know why they did it, we don't know what they're eating, and we're forgetting that the food you eat is possibly more important than if you're having breaks in between eating for either cultural or health reasons. The warnings will certainly stop some people from intermittent fasting, but for others like Suzanne, they'll continue because they're convinced it is doing them more good than harm. Ashish Joshi, Sky News. Still to come here on the UK tonight. Good or bad for the game, we'll examine whether a new regulator for English football will level the playing field or hold teams back.
Welcome back to the UK tonight. The government's called its plan for an independent regulator of English football a historic moment for fans. The new watchdog would be able to block unfit owners from buying teams, ensure clubs are financially sustainable and make sure fans are consulted on major issues. It's been welcomed by the lower leagues, but there are concerns that at the top, with the Premier League saying the plan could weaken English football. Our sports correspondent Rob Harris explains. Football supporters raging against ownership to ensure their clubs still exist to support. Protests now with political power behind them. The culture secretary presenting long delayed plans to regulate the game. How are you, how are you Still work to be done to explain to these late Orient players before taking the bill to Parliament. We're bringing in a football regulator to make sure that football across the board is financially sustainable. There'll be owners and directors tests and so you won't be able to own a club if you don't pass uh, those tests. With constant checks on owners and their finances to be allowed to stay in control. But restrictions on who can own a club only go so far. No block on nation states investing. We are not saying anything about um, who should own a club, where they, where they live. You say it's the government, well, your own department, should it decide potentially then to look at foreign state ownership of football clubs as it has done with newspapers? We won't be bringing in um, any measures in relation to foreign ownership of football clubs. Relations between the rich and the rest are intense, heightened after the failed attempt to create a breakaway European Super League. And now the Premier League has angered the lower leagues further blocking a deal to share more of their wealth. Something the new regulator could now enforce. The system we've got at the moment doesn't produce sustainable clubs. It encourages owners to take um, too many risks, to overinvest, to overspend. The Premier League warns that the regulator could ultimately weaken the appeal and competitiveness of English football. But the government wants to safeguard clubs like this, League One Leighton Orient, which came so close to going out of business. Caution from the Orient vice captain, who's also chair of the National Players Union. I definitely think more needs to be done. I don't, I'm not a massive fan in like over regulating things, but I think we find ourselves here because um, the, the due diligence hasn't been done. Whether the football regulator has too much power or not enough power, it could soon become the destination for every grievance in the game. Rob Harris, Sky News at Leighton Orient. Well, I want to discuss that plan now from the perspective of clubs at opposite ends of the Football League pyramid. I'm joined by Dale Vince, who's chairman of League Two side Forest Green Rovers, and from the Premier League, Stephen Shepherd from the Nottingham Forest Supporters Club. A tale of two forests, uh, if you like. Um, Stephen, I'm going to come to you. Let's talk about Nottingham Forest, because no doubt having a team in the Premier League is the pinnacle. But is it just too hard, just too expensive to stay there? It's, uh, I think every, it's every club's and every supporter's dream to play in the Premier League. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, there's a lot of things wrong with it. But uh, I think everybody aspires to get that far um, or, or, or to at least to, to improve their own circumstances. So, yeah, it, it's a good thing generally. But, um, yes, there is a lot of power there, which uh, I do believe should be shared around a bit more. Do you think it was worth the four-point hit to spend all that money on players to potentially gamble and stay in the Premier League as a result? Well, if we stay in the league, yes, it will be um, justified. But um, uh, if, if we drop down the division, well, you know, perhaps we should we shouldn't have done it. It, um, I mean, the system is a difficult system to 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 manage and work around. Uh, um, it, it was always going to be a struggle when we came up. But, you know, we, we're starting so far back from everybody else. It was always difficult. Uh, and there was always a fair chance that we would overspend. And perhaps, yes, we, we overspent and, you know, it's justified taking four points off us. But, you know, that's, that, that's the way it is. And um, uh, you know, every, our owner is, is an ambitious owner um, and he, he wants us to progress. Yeah, Evangelos Maranakis. Uh, Dale, a lot of people pointing fingers at owners, saying they're the ones who are letting things run out of control. I'm certainly not saying that about Forest Green Rovers, by the way, but where do you think the, the blame lies for this whole situation? Because things are a bit of a mess right now. Yeah, <clears throat> things are a bit of a mess. <clears throat> I think you're right. I think there's 
there are inconsistencies in the management of the leagues. You know, we've got the EFL, we've got the FA, and we've got the Premier League, three different bodies, you know, with an approach, different approaches actually uh, quite often to, uh, to football in our country. The, uh, the sharing of TV revenue from the Premier League isn't being done uh, properly or fairly. I think we have other problems like parachute payments from the Premier League to the Championship, which creates a big distortion for clubs in the Championship trying to get to the Premier League. So there's all kinds of problems which the regulator can look at. I just want to say that um, overall, I think this is a big miss from the government. One, it's great to have a regulator for football. The sole focus on financial sustainability in the teeth of a climate crisis is a mistake. We've lobbied them to include environment sustainability, but they're point blank refused. And, you know, football has an impact, but it also has a platform through football. We can persuade people how to change their lives. So this is a big missed opportunity for me. Uh, I mean, the, the risk is it, that could think like that could be an expensive opportunity, right, for, for clubs. I, I know it's something that Forest Green Rovers is heavily invested in and you've supported them in doing that. But when, when clubs are struggling financially to have that extra um, expenditure on being environmentally sustainable could put some of them out of, out of business, couldn't it? No, I think that's to misunderstand the, uh, the nature of the cost involved in some really basic things that aren't in the rules at the moment. And also to overlook that when you have a set of rules that apply to everybody, it's, uh, it's a level playing field. And so, you know, if money did have to come from the playing budget for the uh, environment budget, that would apply to everybody. So nobody would go, would go bust on this. But the things we've done at Forest Green really don't cost any money. And the things that could be included in the regulations here, they're the same. They don't cost money. Everybody can do it, and especially at the Premier League level. Uh, you know, where they have uh, so much money in, in the first place. I think it's harder, arguably, down through the pyramid. I just want to say we're not at the opposite ends of uh, of the league here, the Premier League and League Two. You've got to remember there are a lot of uh, lot of leagues below us in the national football pyramid. Yeah, uh, Dale, I mean, there are 92 professional clubs in the situation. You, you're right that below that there are clubs that want to get in there. I mean, we've obviously seen that with Wrexham quite famously recently. Have we just got too many professional football clubs in this country? Because it's not certainly not the same in those other big footballing nations like Spain and, uh, and Italy. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting point. I think arguably we have too many foreign players at the top level of our game and it doesn't give the opportunities for English players to you know, hone their craft, develop their skills and then make uh, the England team itself more competitive on the world stage. If you look at it in other countries, they do do it differently. And uh, they, they have better outcomes in international football. Yeah, but what we do have in the Premier League is arguably the preeminent football league in the world. One of Britain's, one of England's great cultural exports. Isn't there a risk, Dale? And I'll ask you this, Stephen, as well in a second. Isn't there a risk that this overregulation could kill the goose that lays the golden egg, which is the Premier League? I think, uh, in theory, you're right. Uh, but actually, right now, we have no regulation. Uh, so to have some regulation, I don't think is a bad thing. The question is, uh, to what degree will that happen? The things I'm reading in the press today about the powers of the new regulator, they don't seem worrying to me. I don't think they'll genuinely worry the Premier League. Uh, you're right, it is the preeminent force in football globally. Uh, but I don't think there's any harm in a little bit of regulation to make sure that football in our country as a whole benefits from a little bit of regulation. Stephen, Nottingham Forest fought to get back into the, the top flight of English football, but it didn't get those parachute payments because it hadn't dropped down recently like others, like Fulham, for example. But you spend all that money, you get 29 players inside a year, many of them are foreign, which obviously Dale pointed to as being uh, an issue. Um, what do you think in terms of the risk to the Premier League, the risk to it being the greatest league in the world with uh, possible overregulation? I, I don't think there, there would be a, a risk, to be honest. I, I do think we do need a regulator. I mean, we've we spent two, so many years uh, in, uh, out, out of the Premier League, so, um, and, and we could quite easily go back again this season or, or in the future. So I, I, I don't fear a regulator, to be honest. I, I think there's a bit of a cartel at the top of the Premier League who, who, who want to dominate things uh, for, the, for their own vestiture. And um, so I'm, I'm not fearful of a regulator. I, I think it's got to be a good thing for, for everybody, to be honest. Depends on his terms of, um, you know, what, what he's got to work on. When the, when the final details come, it's all, it's all a bit speculative at the moment. So until we know what the final details are, uh, it's hard to judge. But in general, I think I'm fav in favour of it. 
You alluded to, well, you used the word cartel. I think we're going to call them the, the big six, the big clubs who dominate the Premier League, who win the titles, the Man Cities, Liverpool, United, Arsenal, Chelsea, Spurs. I think that's the, they're the, the, the big six spenders anyway. Um, they could just pick up their ball and go and play elsewhere, couldn't they? The European Super League is still there in the background. Isn't that a risk, Stephen? It, it is a risk. And, uh, you know, if they, if they want to do that, you know, it, it's really up to them. Uh, I can't it'd see... Be, it would be a big loss, that. though, wouldn't it? It would be a huge... I mean, Forrest not playing at Old Trafford or Anfield, that would be a, it'd be a huge loss. It would be, it'd be a loss, but the, the Premier League would be more of an even league, to be honest. But, I mean, I, I, I do want the clubs to stay, don't get me wrong. But, you know, if, if they decide to go their own way that they want to play Barcelona or Ajax every week, every other week, that, that's up to them. But I'd sooner let the Premier League stay together. And I, and I don't think uh, having a regulator is, is going to uh, affect it, to be honest. OK. OK, look, to finish off, you're both the regulator. One thing that you would do to make football better. Stephen, you first. I think it's down to the finances, to be honest. Um, they need to sort the finances out and, uh, and, and get be and better owners in, uh, in, or in, in situations. So it's, it's really down to the finances. You, know, you can start with that and, and, and work sideways, to be honest. Daly said better owners. If you were a regulator, what would you do? I'd bring in environment regulations uh, for football. I think uh, we have a wonderful platform in football with which we can communicate to our fans and get them to make the kind of lifestyle changes that we need to make to get to net zero. It's a big missed opportunity not to be talking about that in football. Dale, Stephen, fans of forests of a different kind, really appreciate you taking the time. Thanks very much for joining us on uh, the UK tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, could this be the next James Bond? We'll get the latest on reports that this guy from High Wycombe could be named as the next 007. And we'll have the rest of the day's sports as Everton learn their date for their latest hearing on profit and sustainability rules. So every year we invite our local Muslim neighbours and those further afield to come in and break their fast with us. We study together looking at a certain theme each year. This year we looked at the theme of friendship and then we break bread, literally. Together we hear the call for prayer on our bima, on our ritual stage. And then we eat and we sit and we talk for hours often. It's uh, enjoyable, it's really interesting, and I think it's needed. Um, a massive reason why I do the interfaith work that I do is based on Islamic teachings. And I try to revolve my life on the Holy Quran, and the Holy Quran teaches us that as Muslims, we have a duty to protect people of all faiths and religion and to protect places of worship. So working with Alith and going to the Iftar during Ramzan is something that I really look forward to. Um, and I've been there more than once, and it's been, it's been incredible. Definitely. I think that Islamophobia and anti-Semitism are on the rise. And the only way that we break down those barriers is by having really deep, meaningful conversation and building relationships. Friendships are the most important thing that we can offer one another at this time. I think there'll always be conflict in the world. Mm. There'll always be issues and, and conversations that need to be had. Um, and events like this, interfaith events, are super important for us to have an open, honest conversation. Uh, on stage at the, um, at the interfaith, we were talking about how our friendship began working with the United Nations and how it's just developed over time. We've had hard conversations, bearing in mind the current conflict, but it's important that conflicts don't drive wedges between friendships, rather we use a friendship for conversation and dialogue um, so we can move together and build the bridges of unity and unite in our common denominators. I think we are modelling what this can look like and what real dynamic friendships look like in the, w in the world. Uh, we are publicly showing how we can talk to one another, be together, and putting an image out for the younger generation of this is something you can do too, it's something you can achieve. When they see people their own demographic do it, it feels more attainable to them. The beauty of social media is that you're able to put out messages that can reach um, a vast audience across the world. And there are a lot of misconceptions of the Jewish community and the Muslim community. I think having a platform on social media allows you to remove misconceptions allows that space for conversation and dialogue, which is so important, and for us to work together to make the world a better place. Comfortable. 
Welcome back. You're watching the UK tonight. Uh, coming up, we'll be discussing who is heavily tipped to be the next James Bond. But first, Teddy is here with the sport. Good to see you, Teddy. Good to see you. Um, that we've been reading today, there could be some rule changes on the way in rugby, in rugby union, uh, yeah. right, fresh off the back of the Six Nations. Uh, give us a brief summary of the proposals that are on the table. Yeah, brilliant Six Nations, wasn't it? But there's been a Shape of the Game forum ahead of the World Rugby Council meeting in May to discuss some potential changes. Uh, one of them is tackle height. You'll remember a lot of controversy in the community rugby last year, talking about reducing it to belly height or thigh height below the sternum, so the chest plate there. Bringing that into the elite game is going to be considered because of the, the risk of head trauma in the elite game, which we'll maybe talk about in a touch on why these measurements are coming in. And then a change in the, in the red card, because it can massively change the shape of a game, because it's such a physical sport rugby union, that when it goes down to 14 men or women, they're considering now having a 20-minute penalty where you're down to 14 players, but then after the 20-minute elapses, you can bring on a substitute, not the player who's been red-carded, but then someone else off the bench, possibly looking as well at changing the way the television officials use to make it more appealing, more quick in terms of the speed of the game, a VAR debate we've had in, in football as yeah. well. South Africa, New Zealand, Australia and Argentina, by the way, are all behind this change to the, the red card issue. And, and other change is possible, but it seems that the red card and the tackle height are the big ones to be discussed next month, and they are making big changes in rugby. Yeah, it's, it's eerily similar to football, isn't it, with the blue card discussion and this kind of thing? Yeah. I mean, there are already sin bins, of course, in rugby, but if yep. these kind of things have been in place during the World Cup, then things would have been completely different with some of the sendings off we saw there. Why do you think it's considering it now? I think rugby on a number of levels faces, rugby union as a professional game faces, a bit of an existential threat. We've seen three premiership clubs in recent years go to the wall financially. Obviously, a lot of that was to due to COVID. It's a big ticket-driven sport at the club level. National sport's doing better, the RFU, but also simultaneously, I suppose, they say here that the comprehensive phase plan aimed at enforcing rugby's global appeal. So, in effect, they want to make it more popular. The tackle height will make it safer, which is a big issue. We've got 295 players currently who are in legal action against the governing bodies, the RFU, the World Rugby and the Welsh Rugby Union over neurological difficulties, cognitive function problems from playing the sport. So, making it safer, raising the appeal, raising the participation at grassroots levels for parents and then making the sport, I suppose, broadly more entertaining with the, the red card issue as well. So it's a big time for rugby and hopefully it, it works out well for them. Meanwhile, it's a big night for Chelsea's women in the Champions League, which we'll tell you about in just a second. The Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Getting more people more active. Live life with Vitality. One in five people are neurodivergent meaning they have a difference in brain function. This one in five may be autistic, dyslexic, dyspraxic, or have ADHD, or another form of neurodiversity. I think being in sport as someone who's dyslexic and dyscalculic um, can be really challenging day to day, particularly with the numbers and distances and times and things. I think it's something that I've come to realise that the reasons why I do sport have very much to do with the fact that I am neurodiverse as well. Obviously, people will have heard probably of, of dyslexia. I mean, give me a sense of um, what it's like to, to, be, to be both dyslexic and dyscalculic. Dyslexia is words um, and literacy. I'll read a passage of text and I could read it three or four times, but it might not fully go in. So processing in my brain takes a little bit longer. Um, but for me, with dyscalculia, I feel like that affects me a lot more as an adult. Give me a sense of, of how that all comes comes to play. What, what are the main challenges, would you say, in sport? I've been known to miss a couple of flights. Um, and, yeah, I think when you see those things on the board where I've sort of read the flight time and that sort of moved and the gate number haven't aligned, just little things like that, little things like even telling the time on a non-digital clock or knowing how far a distance is in training um, affect me in my day-to-day -day still as an adult. Particularly on race day, we're usually given a call time for when we need to be ready and in the call room. And you sort of have to work back from that time. So there's a lot of numbers and I usually write out a schedule for every uh, race day for what time I'm going to do everything. Just to take that process of thinking away from a really solid support system really helps. Um, my coach is definitely really on board with that. He'll be like, no, we're just going to do two. This Sky News Sports Bulletin is brought to you by Vitality. Now, before we go, just time to talk about Bond, James Bond. You have to do it like that, don't you, every time. Reports today suggest the producers 
are preparing to name the next 007. It's this guy, Aaron Taylor Johnson. He is the man who's supposedly been given the licence to kill. The 33-year-old is best known for his roles in Kick-Ass and Avengers Age of Ultron. Apparently, he's yet to officially accept the part. What's keeping you? Uh, TV and film journalist Jamie Burton joins me now in the studio. Jamie, I do note you have the same initials as James Bond. This is almost meant to... This is perfect. The name's Burton. I won't finish that. Yeah, we'll finish it at the end. <laughs> but Aaron Taylor-Johnson, what do we think? Well, firstly, uh, if he's yet to accept the role, how James Bond is that to be offered the role and then make them wait for it? How very cool <laughs> yeah, of that guy, it's, right? It's true. Uh, it is worth saying, though, yes, there's a lot of reports that he has been offered the role by Eon Films. However, they have been contacted for comments and they have not confirmed this yet. They wouldn't, would they? More importantly, Aaron Taylor-Johnson hasn't confirmed it yet as well. So, yes, while there's a lot of speculation, a lot of rumours people are talking about, uh, is he the next one? We don't know yet. So let's wait and see. And uh, he'd be certainly a popular choice, a safe choice, a lot of people are saying as well. But, uh, yes, no confirmation yet, though. Aaron has been the Betty, the betting, the betting, the bookies' favourite for mm. quite a while. I gather the latest odds are two to one. I mean, you wouldn't really bother with that, would you? Seven to two for Henry Cavill. Um, it, it, it seems, it's pretty much nailed on, right? So it's going to be him. It's getting there, but and, um, yeah, it's it's telling when the bookies, you know, shorten their odds even further. You know, they seem to know something that we don't. But it's not odds on yet. You know, there are a lot of uh, less certainties in life than a two to one favourite. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of people still in the running. You know, uh, there is a Henry Cavill's out there. There's a James Norton's out there. Mm. But yes, Aaron Taylor Johnson definitely front runner at the moment. The names we have talked about are all white uh, British men. There was talk of other people playing Bond this time round. There's been, of course, a lot of talk about Idris Elba. There's talk about uh, people not being British. There's talk about people not being men as well, playing James Bond. So, so what's happened? Well, there's always a talk about what they might do with the James Bond role or with the 007 role as well, which is uh, sometimes remarkably different. Mm -hmm. For example, in the last film, Lashana Lynch, the, uh, the black female British uh, actor, she was given the role of she 007 was. in the film, and that kind of got people talking as well. Um, so it's seen as maybe a suggestion that they might go in a different direction with it. Mm. It would be a revert to type with Aaron Taylor-Johnson, but, uh, yeah, over the years, Idris Elba has definitely been one of the favourites to take over it. He himself has admitted now that he's a bit too old to take it on at this mm. point. Um, yeah, Henry Golding, uh, a British-Asian actor as well, has been discussed. Uh, Damson Idris, who's a young black British actor as well, was definitely in the running as well. And since nothing has been confirmed with uh, Aaron Taylor-Johnson, there is still the possibility that we might get there. However, yes, directions are pointing towards Aaron. Well, why, why do you think we're hearing these rumours today? Is this, is this something that's sneaked out on purpose to just prepare us for the inevitable announcement? Maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, you know, no smoke without fire, I guess you could say. Equally, he's got a couple of films coming out this year as well. The cynic in me might suggest that, uh, you know, this is all a clever ploy to get us talking about him in anticipation of his films, which I won't even mention because I don't want to give him the satisfaction of me mentioning stuff. <laughs> but yes, uh, you know, rumours always circulate, but uh, in this case, while it is a, an unknown source who have said this news, yeah. a lot of uh, news outlets are running with this and, yeah, no smoke without fire, I guess. Let, let, let's talk about those other rumours around the next Bond movie, whenever it may be. And it's, it's been a little while since the, the last one where they just killed him, when, when Daniel Craig... Spoilers. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was, unfortunately. Um, rumours that it may be, A, a period piece set in the 60s, and, B, Christopher Nolan, it could be persuaded to be the director, which could be a bigger deal than whoever plays oh, Bond sure. himself. I think a lot of... Like every actor who's suggested for the role, a lot of directors, when they are asked, would you do a James Bond film, it's very rare that uh, a director would count themselves out of it. So yeah. I, I do know that Christopher Nolan has been asked about it. You'd be silly to discount it because, you know, you don't want to put anything off the table. However, it's nothing but speculation at this point, I guess. It is, it is great that they're hoping to play with the formula, though, because, you know... Uh, it's become a point where James Bond itself can be parodied at this point as well. It's been repeated and copied in so many different versions. So it is perhaps time for a shake-up. Mm -hmm. In terms of it being a few years since... Or a stir up. Oh, yeah, Pff, very clever. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of it being a few years since the last film as well, uh, the last one was delayed by another year because of COVID, remember? That was supposed to come out in 2020. Daniel Craig didn't actually show us No Time to Die until 2021 because of the, the lockdown and everything. Of course. So, yeah, that's kind of set the clocks back a little bit. So we are due, I'd say. Yeah, I think we are due. Uh, you'd be a good cue to my James Bond, but Go you've on. got the initials, JB. Thank you very much indeed. Good to see you. Thank you. OK, let's take a look at the weather now.